this country called the USA And we fly our flag cause we're proud and free We're Americans Red, white and blue is our way of life we never back down from a challenge or a fight Nature provides, God gives the rights We're Americans We make up America It's amazing America Hello, Jimmy. What's going on? This is Sergeant Frank on the Sergeant Frank Show across America. How are you? I'm doing well. I have to tell you, I tell everybody I talk to about you how amazing your attitude is all the time. Well, I appreciate that. And on the other end of this situation we have the bird dog how's it going bud <laughs> what's up buddy i've been looking forward to this all week i have to tell you i was kind of disappointed you're like well can we do it friday i was like oh i can't wait to get jim <laughs> talk to us talk to all our fans about everything that he's been doing everything he does and you know let's let's just start off with where i mean tell us a little bit about you know, where did you work you know, uh, what, what agency did you work for? I was working for the city of Clareton. It's about 25 to 30 minutes outside the city of Pittsburgh. So crime has kind of gone rampant a little bit. They're, we're doing our best to, you know, kind of combat that. But it's a small department, four square miles. Uh, I worked with probably about, you know, up in the words around maybe 20 officers at the time, varying times. Very cool. And what was your position? I worked there as a patrol officer. Okay. Prior to working there, I'd worked for 18 years in uh, a couple other departments, all the way up to working for the county for as a narcotics detective for about uh, nine years, uh, where I did some, you know, some undercover buys and stuff like that, stuff that, you know, you kind of see on TV, which is kind of cool, but kind of not. Well, the bird dog has a pretty vast experience in, I want to say, narcotics as well. Didn't you work in narcotics? Yeah, I only spent four years doing that. Yeah, I, I did it as almost kind of a, a part-time gig. It was, you know, I worked for a township, and within that county, I worked for the district attorney's office, and, you know, all kinds of other officers from other departments worked there as well. So we got to go countywide, uh, ranging from everywhere from just small buys to large incoming sales of cocaine, heroin, everything from Chicago, Detroit, seemed to come in that way from New York, Philadelphia, uh, we also did, you know, for the cities around where we worked, we did, you know, prostitution stings, all kind of stuff. Very the cool. fun and crazy stuff. <laughs> yes, very crazy stuff that you really can't believe happens. Exactly. If people only really knew what goes on. <laughs> oh, yes. Those glamorous prostitutes are not what's out there, really. <laughs> <laughs> it's not like TV. It's definitely not Pretty Woman. No, no. not in the least. Uh, Jim, we know that you were injured on the job. Do you feel comfortable, you know, sharing that experience with us and our listeners? Absolutely. Uh, April 4th, 2011, I was scheduled to come in on the 8 p.m. shift uh, to work with two partners at the time who had already started their 12-hour shift at 6 p.m. And uh, we went out on patrol, all three of us, you know, each in an individual car, work in the city, started answering calls. And about quarter to 11 that evening, we got a, an initial call of a disturbance uh, in a duplex. They could hear loud yells and screams, but they didn't really know the extent of what was occurring. So we all three responded, and uh, we knew that, okay, it's an old duplex. It's got a front door and a back door. They're going to come out either one, or we're going to go in either one. So it was kind of a crapshoot. Each one of us chose a door. I chose the back. John chose the front, and Matt kind of stood there in the middle of them, kind of giving us cover with a long rifle. From there, we I almost gained entry from the rear. The door was cracked when I approached the door, uh, and there's a small deck going up to it. There's four steps and a deck, and as soon as I got up there, the door slammed shut. So I yelled to the guys, came back down the steps, and said, hey, I made contact back here, and I didn't get a chance to hear what contact they had made at the front door. But later I found out that they made contact just with a male voice that said, everything's fine, leave us alone. So we figured, well, we got a good chance of maybe getting the back door. So all three of us went towards the rear, and when I stepped up on the deck and I had my gun out and 
my last step was to get up onto that deck. And as soon as I was facing the front of that door, uh, the door opened in and it was a black void. And next thing I know, I saw an orange muzzle flash. And that began me getting shot five times. Unfortunately, the first round, Murphy's Law, shot me in my right forearm in that point, taking my gun from my hand. So that would explain why I was wondering why I wasn't shooting back. Wow. The other two bullets were stopped by my vest. The third, the fourth bullet went through my vest at my left pectoral muscle, and went into my chest, hit a rib, damaged my lung, and then traveled all the way down across my spine at T12. Right there and then it paralyzed me, and I went from standing to sitting in about a second flat, all while shot five was going through my left armpit. What I didn't know is how close my partners were. John was actually, it, you know, his head was probably close to the, you know, just above the deck level, right below me to the corner. And Matt was taking cover on the side of the house. They actually thought I was shooting. They they easily could have been hit as well. But they gave chase as when I went down, the uh, at least one or both of the perpetrators ran out the back door. And I thought were actually walking and was going to kill me. But they ran over me and ran out the back. And as Matt and John gave chase, uh, they finally were able to hear that uh, I was kind of yelling for some help. And uh, Matt turned around and was able to see me as he brought up his long gun because he didn't know who it was. And uh, the flashlight hit me and he saw that it was me laying on the deck. And at that point, those two decided to turn around and they came back over to the deck. Uh, John was given cover because they didn't know not knowing what was in the house and who was in the house or where the suspects were. They came back over. Matt literally picked me up off the deck, threw me over his shoulder. He carried me out to the front and about a house down. And uh, they both started attending to my wounds, waiting for the ambulance and the cavalry to come. And uh, that's all I saw after that was when all the fun happened. I was told that uh, 47 different police departments from the county responded to uh, start basically shutting the city down and searching everywhere for the suspects. Yeah, I was going to ask you because you said there was three of you working and all three of you were there if the county and other agencies provided the backup. Yeah, when they with in the Mon Valley area in, in the city of Pittsburgh, it's all small departments lined all the way up along the river. And everybody pretty much relies on all the other departments for your backup. You know, there a lot of these are depressed communities that just don't have the wherewithal to have, you know, a well-staffed police department above and beyond like what the city of Pittsburgh has in Allegheny County. So the all call went out that there was an officer down shot. And when that happens, everything else gets dropped and everybody responds. Uh, That's they, right. Yeah. They even put up the state police helicopter was up and flying through horrible weather to the degree that when they called for the medical helicopter for me, they would not fly. Wow. So, yeah. So I basically went by ambulance to the hospital. So that's right. kind of the short of it there. You know, that's, uh, that's what brought me to my current lifestyle. So can you discuss what your, what, what that meant for you, the injuries? Got to the hospital and went right into trauma surgery and, uh, it, once I made it through the surgery, which was only surgery to stop the bleeding in my chest uh, to save my life, they never did any surgery to my back to attempt to repair anything they could because there's not much you can do with the spine. They said it would be about two days to see if I could make it through those two days and see where I was. And I did. But they immediately told my, my parents and at the time, my girlfriend, Chris, that I was never going to walk again. That's what they say. I kind of disagree, but we'll see. So then after that... We, we started doing uh, pretty much, it was 47 days in the hospital, and a lot of that was 37 days of basically just rehabbing, you know, getting to learn the way of life, which is being confined, not confined to a wheelchair, but I'll say a mode of transportation, learning what you had to do otherwise to you know, go to the bathroom, get into cars, you know, transfer from your chair to seats and chairs and sofas. And then it's they kind of just throw you out there to the world and say, all right, up to you now and it just took about a couple of years to try to finally find that not comfort zone but just kind of what works right so did they catch the bad guys well that is another story for a book but i'll give you the short of it <laughs> they did they did catch one and that was within a week 
they had actually arrested two suspects, but they were cleared by their alibis. They didn't catch the second, which was turned out to be the shooter, until about six months later. And that was only through the investigations of a bunch of agencies being DEA, ATF, FBI, the local county narcotics were running cases. And they used all their resources once they found out that confidential informant told them, I know the guy who shot that officer. And, of course, he only came forward with that news because he had charges pending. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. But he did prove to be credible. Uh, He did testify. He did use uh, in Pennsylvania as a non-consensual wire. And they got the admission from the shooter that, yeah, he shot me and should have went back and killed me. Wow. Now, wow. once he was arrested, he was also admitted, you know, during an interview and interrogation that, yeah, he did it. Now, when you go to trial, that's a different thing. Trial right. went off. Trial went off the end of, Ju- end of July 2012, lasted five and a half weeks, of which uh, numerous eventful and comedic things happened. But ultimately... The gentleman that shot, not even say gentleman, the person that shot me got convicted of 50 to 100 years for the home invasion, the uh, aggravated assault of the husband, the attempted rape of the wife, the attempted homicide of the child, all because they went to this house because it was a drug dealer's home and they wanted his drugs and money. So that's the, the only thing he wasn't convicted of was shooting me. What? Yes. Uh, the jurors would have been happy if they could have seen the gun, but obviously we didn't have the gun and they weren't going to give it to us. And the second suspect, the one that they got initially, he was acquitted. Wow. Yeah. So those are the, the sticking points of it, basically. Uh, we would have been better off because the victim, being the wife, uh, got kind of played and confused, I believe, by the defense. See, when they went and asked her what they looked like in the in the, when the incident happened. The shooter, who is uh, of Puerto Rican descent, so he's a light-skinned, dark-skinned male, had his hair in, in braided cornrows, and it was a little long down onto his neck. The other shooter, being a biracial male, had his hair pulled long back into a bushy ponytail. Now, come to trial a year later, that was reversed. Hmm. So they reversed hairstyles as well as she could not correlate which person had which gun, you know, which one was the revolver, which one was a semi-automatic gun, which one was black, which one was silver. Because at the scene, there were no shell casings found. I was shot five times, could have been a six. So that ultimately kind of gives you the idea that that is a revolver. Right. So when they interviewed her on a stand for her testimony, she was really confused about all that. I think that didn't help us. And ultimately, when she didn't come across as this poor mother who watched them threaten to kill their child by putting a gun in its mouth. She never once shed a tear. She didn't get upset. So it was basically someone who saw this as a possibility as being the wife of a drug dealer. Hmm. Right. You know, and that's probably the case. <laughs> Yeah. And my thought about it is, I don't care. At least the lives were, their lives were saved as well as the children. That's all that matters. True. You know, um, it's not the kid's fault that their parents aren't uh, in the proper line of work. So maybe someday those kids will return the favor for somebody else. Pretty amazing. Pretty amazing. And, and you know, when you look back at the situation, I'm, I mean, I'm sure that that anybody that's been in that situation, I know Danny's been in a, a few shootings. You ever go back and say, "Well, I wonder what if?" Does that ever? You know, happen? I, I don't often go back and think, "What would I have done differently?" I've been asked the question. You know, I've I've spoken at police academies, I've spoken in colleges, and you know, they they say, "What would you have done differently that day?" And jokingly, I said, "I I would have called off sick." right but in all reality with the information that we were given for the call i would have still approached the house because you have to ascertain information as to what would be your next step of action 
Right. We didn't know they were armed. We had no idea that, you know, they were willing to shoot their way out because the victim also said that the two suspects said we have to shoot our way out. I had no knowledge of this. Had I known it was kind of a hostage situation, we would have perimetered the house and never tried to enter. Sure. We didn't know that. You know, that, I think you bring up a good point because a lot of times, you know, we see these different uh, training videos and, and people watching TV and movies. You know, they think it's just a totally different scenario. But when your boots on the ground and you have to go to that call, you know, somebody has to approach the house. Somebody has to find out what's going on. And sometimes it works out well and sometimes it doesn't. But as police officers and deputies, we still have to go into that scene. I mean, it's nobody else is going to do it. You know, nobody in the, in the office setting is going to run out there and take care of business. It's up to the people that are, you know, on the street, you know, in the trenches taking care of business. So sure, and and it does get blurred by you know what they see on TV and in movies. Whereas you know, with us, it's a reality. And and don't get me wrong, I was 18 years on the job. I was well trained in tactics and how to respond to domestic calls and disturbances. It is just what happened. At the time, the scenario, I look back, I always say, you know, I was a single man at the time. I, I had family, but I didn't have any children. Whereas my partner, Matt, he had had, you know, a son and a daughter and a wife. John, the younger man uh, partner, he was, you know, just three, four years into his career, you know, trying to work up in departments. Not happy it happened to me, but I'm happier that I wouldn't have had to see what went through their families what they had to go through i had to see what my family went through i hopefully was strong enough for them to say hey i'm still here right the well you're definitely part. strong enough <laughs> anybody yeah. can take five shots like that and and still here to talk about it is a superman in my book yeah i appreciate that man even ever every time i say it i'm, I'm like man five shots I, I just don't know how it came to be you know it's you think about it People die from one single bullet sometimes, and I'm just fortunate enough to have made it through. Something that kind of haunts me about it, and I always try and bring it up because we as police officers, as well as military, need to be aware of it is only two and a half years ago, uh, John, the youngest partner of mine, committed suicide. Wow. Yeah. It often crosses my mind, did I ask him enough to see that he was all right? I saw him enough. I saw him time after time, a few times throughout the year. He had worked in a new department after that and then got hired as another one that I had family in. Yeah, every time I'd see him, the guy always had a smile on his face, you know, you, and he's like, Jimmy, I'm good. Yeah, everything's good. Married his girlfriend, who was also a police officer we worked with. They had it going good. Then in January, two years ago, it just came all crashing down. Well, you know, and, cops aren't going to tell you. They're kind of reserved. They're not going to tell you how they really feel. That's kind of tough to get information out of them. That's what I've learned over the years. Yeah, and with the numbers of how many police officers do, it's that stigma. Who wants anybody in the department to know that you, oh, my God, had to pour your heart out or that call bothered you? I mean, what kind of man are you? Yeah. Which is a bunch of bull, if you ask me. It's, you know. I agree. So that's just one thing I, that haunts me. I just kind of, oddly enough with me, we I was honored to have been part of Heroes Behind the Badge documentary and Sacrifice and Survival. Modern City Entertainment did that production of it. And in that, I was interviewed, Chris was interviewed as my fiance, and John was interviewed as my partner. So it's always there to see him talk a, a little bit about the incident and forever have his face there. So it's... um. Just one of those things, you know, we move forward and try and help everybody else with it. It's really, um, like you said, like you both were talking about, those wounds go so deep. And, you know, we had another guest on not too long ago. He was talking about the difficulty that he was dealing with with his scenario. The point where he decided he needed help was he was sitting on his front porch with a shotgun in his mouth. And he was like, you know, I think I need help, you know, and sometimes. Sure. Sometimes we don't get that second chance. You know, his family loves him and everything else, and, you know, he overcame some very difficult situations to get where he's at. And I think it's important that just because you ask for help does not make you a weaker human being. No, it, it almost makes you stronger just for the sheer fact that you can acknowledge that there's something in your head that's bothering you. 
bothering you to the point where you're thinking of the only way out is to kill yourself. Once you get the realization, wow, you know what? There's so much out there that I'm missing that I'm not seeing that once I got this help, I can conquer it. Right. You know, when, when after my incident, I didn't come out all happy and rosy right away. You know, I had a, some issues for a while. And the good thing about uh, what occurred was we were met by the victims of violent crime advocate. Mm-hmm. And she said, look, you have you are a victim. You and Chris, your family are victims. We have the resources for anybody you want to talk to. And Chris and I did. We went right in, starting to talk to a, a woman that was a counselor and we dealt with her for about a year and you know what i had no idea really how much was bothering me until you you know you're just in a vehicle one day and you hear uh, a tire blow out on a truck trailer and chris looks at me and i'm i'm frantic and i'm sitting there fearful and scared and not knowing what to do and she had never seen that and then when you go to the counselor and she makes you understand and teaches you that that's because that sound puts you in the situation, right. not you talking about it. It took you back to the same hypervigilance and fear you were in at that time. Right. So we worked through it for over a year and to the point where that I could literally, okay, yeah, you're bothered by it. Calm down. Let's work through it. And, uh, it's gotten me through seven years so far. Well, I think that's really important to share that because there is a light at the other end of that tunnel. And for, uh, you know, some people, it's a different time frame, you know, for somebody it might be eight years, for somebody it might be two years, you know, it might be six months. You don't really know. It kind of depends on the person and everything else that they've experienced in their lives. And, you know, don't compare yourself to anybody else and their therapy because you can't, you know, everybody's different. Yeah, exactly. Everybody, I don't care how bad the situation it was or what you were able to come through with. It may have bothered someone else extremely detrimental in the same situation we can only just say hey you know what let's help whoever we can and just be there you know as a person to help but you know what otherwise i i think i'm uh i think i'm doing okay what do you guys think oh <laughs> i think so you're my Your favorite person is, yeah is, is awesome yeah i i just hearing you guys say that to me and, and other people just makes me happy because you know what hey i woke up today i got to see my fiance play with the dogs i'm talking to you guys it's sunny outside. How bad can it be? We are so honored that you've agreed to come aboard our program to help us with Adopt a Cop USA because, you know, when you go to our website, myaacusa.org, and you see your face, now you and Danny have to have the grumpy mugs. I, I get it. <laughs> but I know what's funny is now people listening to this go, oh, that's that guy. And he doesn't sound he doesn't sound like that guy when they look at your picture. <laughs> this cracks me up. Maybe we'll have to do the before and afters or yeah, something. Yeah, I'm gonna I gotta get a picture of you smiling. One of these Danny, forget it. He will never smile in a picture. It's, it's a it's a roll. I just can't smile for a picture. Oh, he's <laughs> so much fun. But the uh, but the other thing that I think is important to bring out on this show is on Jim's line, you can hear something barking and it's not Chris. No. And then in Danny's line, you hear something crying, and it's not Bambi. Heard my, my granddaughter. Sorry. But what's no, really cool funny. about that is, and I and I know that at the Wounded Officer Initiative, that there were some officers there that had their therapy dogs with them. What role has your your dogs? Now, did you have those dogs before the incident, or did that happen after the incident? No, Chris. Chris came into my life with the dogs. Um, okay. The first, the two main dogs which Chris came into my life with was Zena, the female. She was younger, and Zarwin, the older, the male. He was just two years older. Let me tell you something, boy. In a short period of time of dating her a year, did those dogs become like my children? We didn't go anywhere without them. They were in the truck with us anywhere we went, and I got into it. Ultimately, at another time, we could talk more about it. When I was laying there on on the deck, basically clinging to life and making the realization that it was up to me if I was going to live. I remember the thought coming across my mind amongst others of those two dogs sitting there on my chest, panting, looking at me like, Oh, so it's hard to breathe. Look at us all the time. Every time you run us, <laughs> I don't want to, you know, I don't want to hear your crap about it's hard to breathe. It, Cause just because you got shot in your chest. <laughs> and, and honestly, it's one of the things that crossed my mind. 
after that, once I was in the hospital, probably not immediately, but probably within about two, two and a half weeks in. So ultimately, these two dogs that I went to all these classes with ultimately became my therapy dogs. So they came into the hospital, stayed with me in the hospital. You know, you have pictures of them jumping up on the bed with me. When you ask what kind of role did they play, they were one of the largest roles in my life. Very, very cool. And, and I mean, I guess it, I would say it's almost coincidental, but you probably didn't think at the time that they were going to become your therapy dogs. Absolutely not. Probably not too awful long before my incident, we had taken both into, it was a nursing home that Chris's mother had worked in. All the people were just ecstatic to see them because Sarwin was this huge German shepherd, but was a teddy bear. Zena was a little smaller and kind of like bouncing around and Zara just lumbered around and they were happy to see them. And before we left, one woman grabbed us. She said, would you mind coming into my mother's room? We don't think she has long, but Mm. she would just love, I think, to see the dogs. Wow. Absolutely. So we go into the room. You could tell that, you know, the family's dealing with the inevitable death of their mother. She was just seated in a chair, no movement. Her eyes were closed. And when Zena came over and just popped up her front paws on her lap and licked her, and she got the pet, she goes, the woman's teeth just opened up into this huge smile. Wow. And Zarwin laid up on the bed next to her and her family watched is she got to pet both of them just to see that look on the family's face and her face was just such a gift and a gift to them and a gift to us to the point where we left feeling happy that we could do that. And probably about a month later, Chris's mom calls us. She goes, did you read Sunday's paper letter to the editor? We're like, no. And there was a letter written by that daughter of the woman who died thanking us for how nice it was for Chris and Jim to bring those dogs in to see the last smile we ever saw on their mother's face. <laughs> so that's pretty. When I tell you my dogs mean everything to us, they mean everything to us. Well, that's that's really beautiful, Jim. I um I didn't know that so was going to go that direction when I asked the question, but I'm I, certainly listen, glad I that it did. I hadn't thought about that for so long. <laughs> We still have Zena. Zena's 12 now. Wow, that's a long uh, she's time. She's got her that. little ailments for being an old girl, but she's out there. That's the main one you hear barking. We also have two newer ones. Uh, Zena's out there barking at the other one so she can beat them up. Uh, <laughs> Zoe, our middle child, she does competitive dock diving. So they run and dive off a dock for distance. Zena was the old, the old girl, was Chris's uh, human remains detection dog, cadaver dog for search and rescue. We retired her. And now our young girl, which is four, she is now Chris's current certified cadaver dog for search and rescue. These are working dogs. And the bloodline from our two young girls are from two police canines that were bred. They're out there jumping incessantly into the pool we have uh, (laughs) nonstop getting beat up by the old girl. Jim, I want to go back to when you were on the platform, and you know we never really talk about this anymore in training scenarios, and I don't, I don't really know why, but nobody really talks about the officer survival uh, techniques that we learned when we were uh, in, you know, starting off. I mean, I know you were saying it was about the dogs, and you went to that place. Is that is that the main thing that that made you fight through that situation? I mean, was that it? Or was there other things that you were thinking about? Once I hit the deck i mean literally my head went through the spindle on the back of the deck gave me a kind of a loopy feeling i never lost consciousness uh it started to become difficult to breathe i just actually started realizing how bad it was right couldn't find couldn't find my gun ultimately i could feel the 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 amount of blood coming out and i'm like look this is bad i can't breathe kind of the training of 18 years and I'd been to street survival four times. I'm like, okay, let's, what do we got to do here? And it was look for your gun. I couldn't find my gun. Okay. Reach for your mic, call for help. Well, one of the bullets hit my microphone on my chest. Oh my gosh. And blew, it, blew it 15 feet into the yard. Now my radio <laughs> doesn't work. Then it was, why can't you get up? I hit, I'm like feeling my leg and okay, that's not good. Cause it's not moving. And I'm telling it to, and it's like, Jim, you're in a pretty bad place right now. But when I say all this, it wasn't like happening so fast. It was happening in such a slow, slow process. To me, it felt like I had minutes of this going on, but ultimately it was seconds. 
first thing that kicked in was my training. It was like, okay, let's get out of here. Let's get what you got to get. You're gone and go. Once that said, I've done everything I can do for there. Let's concentrate on everything else. What came into mind immediately was I can't breathe. Just can't get that breath into me to yell for help. And then started possibility you're going to die here. And I saw my family. And after all that stuff had happened, it literally, I said, you know what? If I just close my eyes, let that last breath out, I'm peaceful right now. I, I wasn't upset. I wasn't scared. I wasn't in pain. All of a sudden, I just, my eyes were wide open. I said, there is no way in hell I'm going to die on this porch. I said, as long as I can hear myself talk, which I was talking out to myself, I'm alive. I just breathed in as much as I could and started yelling, Matt, John, I'm down. Help, I'm down. I'm hit. And apparently, it was loud enough that from 25 yards, because they had run to the backyard to an alleyway, giving chase to the suspects, and they heard me. Right. I said, as long as I'm still talking and people were responding to me, I'm alive. So I never shut up from the time Matt picked me up, from the time they put me in the ambulance until I got to the ER. It was pretty much a lot of survival revolving around training. My, I don't, I say faith, but faith in a different way is faith of, I wasn't sitting there knowing that I had Jesus in my life to the point where it was, I'd grown up Catholic, I'd gone to a Catholic high school, probably hadn't thought a lot or enough in my last few years because I'd been jaded by the job. Right. But it was that, that other hand in the scenario that I, I wasn't alone and something was helping me get through this. Well, and uh, those things in unison are what would save my life. Well, I, I really appreciate you sharing that with us because and our listeners because a lot of the... A lot of younger police officers, even people that are on the job now, uh, I think that it's really important for them to understand that you need to train. You need to think about a scenario, what what if, how many times do we see the traffic lights in our patrol cars and we're like, okay, if the guy or girl in front of us jumps out and does this, what do we do? You kind of have to have that constant dialogue to be ready for the what if happened. And I don't see it a lot in a lot of the uh, trainings that we were going, the, the later years in our, my career. But I think officer survival is a very strong, I think it would ultimately help a lot of officers that come into that situation to, to survive. You make such a good point of that because think about the three of us here talking, probably spent about the same amount of time on the job, 20, 25, 30 years, around the same time in life. Right. Now, every scenario that I go into an academy and talk to the classes and ultimately see them on the job, have a tourniquet on them. Right. And are initially trained in immediate trauma care. All that stuff. We never had any of that. Right. You're, no. telling, me, you're telling me I'm going to get shot in the arm and I'm going to put a tourniquet on? Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm and, actually glad you brought that up because during the shooting in Florida, uh, a lot of the Coral Springs officers had those uh, tourniquets and, and battle bandages on them, uh, part of their kits. And if it weren't for that, a lot of those kids wouldn't have made it. It was a humongous factor in saving lives at that in that incident. And of course, nobody talks about it. But it's it is. Yeah. And those tourniquets and bandages are actually for the officers. But they had them, and they used them, and ultimately they saved a lot of lives because of it. Uh, Bird yeah, dog, do you have any other questions for uh, for that part of the the interview? No, no, no. I'm just listening to what he's got to say. It's very interesting. Jim, I, I know this is difficult, and I really appreciate you opening up to us because a lot of our interviews, you know, sometimes I think people hold back, and, and it's obvious that you've discussed this a few times. Yeah, I've been around the block on it. I've, I've come to the point where I'm comfortable talking about it because when I talk about it now, mostly about the scenario itself does not bring up that emotional response, you know, having to think about that scenario went into the nursing home. I have thought about that for years. You know, the case, I'm glad enough that I can think back and that I was actually alert going through it so that it now becomes something that I can use to hopefully get that next person through. Fortunately, we both, we all three know this. It hasn't slowed down with us getting shot. Definitely not, unfortunately. And that's why this program is so important. And that's the gist of it, to change the perception of law enforcement with our youth yes. so that they understand we're not the enemy and no. that we're ultimately there to help 
them and their families. I, honestly, I got tired of going to funerals for police officers all over the country. And I knew yeah. that something had to be done. I looked around and I couldn't find, because I really just wanted to go work for somebody that had a program like this. Mm -hmm. I couldn't find anything that, that was in the elementary schools with officers. And I was like, there's 360 million people in this country. How do we not have this? You know, and then later yeah. on, uh, when, when Danny came on board, I mean, I have to tell you, he came at the right time because I was like, I need help, man. I need a 94. I need a backup over here because I, <laughs> I was getting beat up pretty bad, you know. And uh, he, yeah. he honestly, I mean, he saved the program at that point because I was, I was, I was dealing with people that were unscrupulous. And I tell you what, man, if it wasn't for his backbone and his danniness, uh, we wouldn't have an adopt a cop today. <laughs> it is. It's needed because apparently we have to be the next generation of mentors. Hey, you run to a policeman when you need help. Right. right that person is there to be respected and honored and looked upon as someone that can help you. Absolutely. Because that's what we're doing in elementary schools. We're there to mentor and protect. Because having a certified officer in that school... Uh, that's needed, unfortunately, today. And I'm glad that, that as we're making really great strides and, and developing that into a, a situation that's actually coming to fruition right in front of our eyes, it's very humbling for me because it's, it's, it was a dream. And I had worked in a program for 18 years raising kids into police officers. And, you know, we, we talked a, bit, a little bit briefly about the Explorer program in another episode. And the Explorer program is such an awesome program for your agency. You get seven years to mold these individuals into the police officers that you need on the streets to protect our children and our families and, and our loved ones. And it, it's it just it's mind boggling when you can see that happen. And I know that Danny, uh, one of our explorers, actually became a motorman due to his tutelage. You know, or he wow. took him under his wing, and most of the traits are good. Uh, that he sure. he learned and developed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I say that totally in jest um, because, you know, Danny's, Danny was a tenacious ticket writer and investigator, and, you know, that's something that he passed on to that young man. And, and it, it was, <laughs> he came from a really bad light, and because of that program, we were able to help him go to the right side of, of justice. Yeah, some of us, uh, we had a knack at writing those tickets. I have to say I was kind of one of them. But, uh, well, it was, oh. was, was kind of my job for the last 12 years of my career. I was a motorman. Yeah, uh, absolutely. That's what my job is, you know? Mm -hmm. And, yeah. I, you know, people are like, you don't feel guilty? I'm like, well, kind no. of, but it, this is my <laughs> job. I mean, I have to do it. I mean, I, did I feel bad? Yeah, there was times I felt bad, but I had to do it, you know? So yes. it's like I can't, I can't give everybody a warning because most people don't uh, respect a warning, you know? I go back to the fact that when I was in middle school and even the beginning of high school, if you did something wrong, you got spanked. We need more spanking today, I believe. That may come in the form of a yellow ticket with my uh, signature on it. I think it should come back to the schools with a little wooden paddle. We got to do certain many jobs in this line. And a lot of them we don't like to do, but it's a have to kind of thing. Well, even going back to, to giving warnings, there was, I, I, I specifically remember a three day period where I got the same lady in three different locations within our city three days in a row. <laughs> so it's like even a ticket wasn't slowing her down. Yeah. Yeah, you just can't teach some people. I've also been told you can't fix stupid. <laughs> <laughs> That's such a great statement. I love that statement. Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> so, Jim, take us to where you are today and what you're doing across our nation. What, what's going on now? What, what, do you, what do you guys do? I was fortunate enough to uh, speak to the right people at the right time. I've always had an enjoyment in hunting and shooting sports. After I'd gotten through a lot of physical therapy over the years and, and gotten comfortable with being out and doing things a little more physical, uh, I just started shooting, and I happened to be given the opportunity from – uh, the Glock manufacturer, and they gave me the opportunity to go to these competitions as a brand ambassador and a competitor to just kind of showcase what Glock has done for not only law enforcement, but for the civilians, to hunters. Uh, it's amazing what you can do good things with with firearms. Never bad, in my opinion. It's just the, 
the beholder of what they do with it's the, a tool with it's a tool yeah it's a tool i use the tool to kind of show people that just because you're in a wheelchair doesn't mean you have to sit around and be a bump on a log i go do these i just got finished with the uspsa nationals shooting down in florida where i shot three days straight Glock has enabled me to do that they've had me travel all over the country to uh go to these shoots and get my name out there with their name and their product. And boy, am I happy to do so. So it, uh, that's kind of what's occupied my life. Now what occupies the other half is everywhere we go with our dogs. You know, we're either dock diving or Chris is going to another cadaver seminar, which he's doing this weekend. We were uh, invited to the world championship dock dog event last year in Knoxville, Tennessee. The girls also received their invitation this year. We just weren't able to go. So we're pretty much uh, on the go all the time. We really appreciate you taking time out of your schedule to come on to our, our show and talk about your past, your present, and the future. And I know that a certain founder of a certain nonprofit has asked you to get your instructor certificate back in line so you could teach some young people about gun safety. Absolutely. I, I think I've heard of that gentleman, and I think uh, we, we're going to discuss that further so we can get out there and get these kids involved in whatever sport they're comfortable with and, uh, you know, start their lives off right. And not to put you on the spot, but, you know, this is also for the parents. So it's not just the children, but it's, it's the team of the parent and the children learning safety because a lot of adults don't get that safety training either and you're you know they're allowed to purchase weapons and they need to be trained you know i think every one of us agree that more training would prevent a lot and and securing weapons will prevent a lot of tragedies in the future i think a lot of what it is is uh lack of knowledge for one uh if you don't have the ultimate knowledge of what that tool is capable of it's going to hurt somebody there's only one last question jim for this episode and it's this why are you always so up? I just wish I had a, a couple word answer for it. I think the ultimate answer for it is going to be, it's a beautiful day. I got up after doing three days of something I love. I got back to see Chris and the dogs. And why, <laughs> they barked right on cue. There they go. <laughs> right there, yeah. Why? Why have even the slightest thought of being miserable or upset? Cross my mind. Don't get me wrong. My butt's a little painful, a little sore after sitting for so three days and, you know, pushing my butt around a lot. There's no reason to be anything but happy and upbeat. Well, Jim, you're an inspiration not only to to Danny and myself, but to so many law enforcement officers out there serving, so many that have served, and all the future ones that are listening to this that are thinking about serving because – if somebody like you can go and do what you've done and still be positive and, and really still believe in our system, then there's hope for America. And I salute you, you amazing American. And we're going to yeah. do a lot of cool stuff with you in the future. Oh, I hope so. So, again, thank you, thank you so much for taking time out. And Got I know it. that the Grandpa Bird Dog <laughs> Babysitting Program uh, is on the road, <laughs> and I really appreciate yeah. him taking time out. And you know what? A lot of people will be like, oh, the baby's crying. Oh, the dog's barking. Well, this is a real show. These are real Americans, yeah. amazing Americans, doing everything they could, you know, put the United back in the United States and help our program of Adopt a Cop USA continue our quest of casting hope and catching dreams with the youth of our country. So thank you guys so much. We will definitely be in touch. And, uh, Jim, don't forget, we need that schedule so we can put you on our calendar so that people want to come see you and watch your amazing shooting skills and see your awesome dogs and your phenomenal fiancé. And, you know, same with the bird dog. If you want to go out to the the bird dog petting zoo at his house, please (laughs) please feel free to contact us. And possible babysitting if Exactly. We'll let you change a couple diapers while you're at it. (laughs) <laughs> you got it guys alright sir have a safe trip thank you so much we'll talk to you guys real soon you got it thank you bye bye